We have navigated darkness and despair together, and so we lift up pleas and praises to our gentle and hopeful God as we raise the following prayers. God, give strength to a friend who is battling mental illness. Help me get through the end of a significant relationship. For all Americans, especially those running in elections, that they might know your deep love for all. Help those in Israel who are suffering. God be with my family as we deal with some financial stress. Jesus would be with my boyfriend and his family as they work out their relationships. Please pray for my niece that her surgery goes well. Grant courage to all those battling the impacts of unhealthy ambitions and convenient untruths. Help me to get along better with my in-laws. For a coworker dealing with the effects of cancer surgery, motivate me to help people more even when I don't like them. Please give me more patience as I cope with my boyfriend. Give my family peace as we deal with damage to our home. Protect my girlfriend from bad influences and dark tendencies. Grant grace and strength to those dealing with the war in Ukraine. Help all those impacted by the recent floods and mudslides. God, help me to better trust your plan and help me to figure out my relationship. Heal my girlfriend's family from fallout from their stubbornness and temper. Give healing to a cousin who is mad at the world. I'm at the end of a relationship and I need strength not to give up on life. Heavenly Father, hear the prayers of our blended community and those intentions only fully known in the depths of our individual hearts. Help us to not be like Judas, not to let our personal truths to lead us to be misguided, impatient, judgmental, or hard-hearted. Grant us all your pardon, your passion, and the gift of your peace as we grope in the darkness of a garden strongly steeped in betrayal, complicity, duplicity, and collusion in the death of our loving Savior. Be with and direct us through dark times and guide us to joy as after Easter times bloom so we can best share your hopeful promises with those who are hurt and angry and in need. We ask this as tribute to your greater glory and as a gift share for your overarching love. I have on my Easter finery, I don't wear ties very often, my neck's getting fat. These are things that I've realized this Easter broadcast. I do like this tie. It's an old tie. It's narrow. I like the collar because it buttons down, and I liked my neck when it fit it better. You know, there's a whole tradition with Easter finery. It used to be, in many countries, you would get new clothes for Easter. And there is a history on that. That, it, in fact, what they said even in this country around Civil War time is, if you got new clothes for Easter, you would have luck all year. And the history and the tradition has to go back to Christians then sort of wearing a white or a clean garment after baptism, so that they could say that they were perfected and ready for a new chapter in life to connect with God. So your Easter finery, getting a, a new frock for Easter, a new tie, a new shirt. Uh, was different than wearing your best clothes. It was wearing new clothes to start a new chapter. They weren't stained, they weren't frayed, and they were ready to go. At a time, especially not that long ago, where clothes were well used, so they had stains and frays, and you just kept them up the best you could. When I was a wee me, a much younger me, there was a story that I enjoyed, but also really distressed me, called The Emperor's New Clothes. And it was out of the Little Mermaid series published by... Um, Han Christian Andersen, it was a fairy tale. You probably know it. Basically, the emperor supposedly had beautiful finery, sort of new Easter clothes, but only people that were really gifted and perfect and swell could see them. So, of course, no one could see them, and the emperor was naked. And if you said anything to the emperor, he thought you weren't worthy enough to see his beautiful new clothes, and he and himself was worried that he couldn't see them, which meant he wasn't worthy enough to see his new clothes and so on. At the end of the day, you have a naked emperor, walking about. Now, it's one thing to have a neck that's a bit fat, but I still could get the button buttoned. But I would be very sad if I had to appear in front of you shirtless. I'm not at the stage in my life where I know that. And I would feel very naked without the constriction of these clothes, which are clothes I like, knowing that I was in my Easter finery. But the story is the opposite of that. It's something that says I can let things hang out, warts and all, which is one thing but also to think that I don't have those things, warts and all. 
that I actually am covered in finery, which is hiding those warts. And if you cannot see my finery, then somehow it's your fault. Well, where does that sit with Easter? Well, it's complicated then. It's complicated. Do the clothes make the man <laughs> or the woman? I think what you could say is no, but the fact that you would wear brand new clothes to start a new relationship or to signify or symbolize the blessing of an old and treasured relationship is delightful. It says that I care about you, God or person, so much that I will get this finery. It's different than renting your wedding garment. It's something that you will wear, not just for the occasion, but in those times in between, before you celebrate it with a new outfit on that anniversary, where you work to keep it clean, where you work to keep it from being too threadbare, but you also want to wear it enough that it shows off that you're proud of it. And so you have to get one next year because it will be well used and well worn. And you will try to keep it up so that people see it as you want them to, as pressed and clean and untattered as you can. But you don't put the burden on them to see you as you want to be seen because then it's that difference between truth and real. You may think that you look 20 and that you're thin and that your neck size is still a 17, but you're not 20, you're not thin, and your neck size is now an 18 and a half. That's not a bad thing unless you really expect people to see you differently. Now, if it really was important to me, I would probably need to go on a diet or at least buy a new shirt. As it is, I know how you'll see me because it's how I am, and I'm okay with being in the real. There's a little bit of threadbare on here, but not much. In fact, the history of these clothes is good. The tie, the shirt, the vest, they're all gifts from my family. My wife in heaven, the kids who are grown, and I'm comfortable in this. They're not my new clothes because I'm not the emperor. I'm just a guy in clothes that show the love that people had for me and feel snuggled into them like we snuggle down in God's palm. So how do we take this then into our Easter? How do we, how do we bear fruit? How do we really make sure that we are worthy of the clothes that we inherit and the new clothes we buy? How do we put them to good use to symbolize and show that we're there to serve and lead? Let's listen to some scripture and we'll come back with our Easter charge to figure those things out. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck, and that house could not be shaken, because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. No 
Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. The treachery betrays. With treachery, the treacherous betray. Terror and pit and snare await you people of earth. Whoever flees at the sound of terror will fall into the pit. Whoever climbs out of the pit will be caught in the snare. We have been through the passion of Christ. The passion from Latin, the Latin pater, to suffer, to bear, to endure. In Luke, we heard both suffering, bearing, and enduring. We, we talked about the clothes and whether or not they made the man. We talked about building the house on a firm foundation. We talked about those that may be blessed on earth and in heaven and how that works. We, we heard that then as part of our charge. I was blessed for a number of years to run a soup kitchen, among other things. It was a pretty big soup kitchen. And... I wore vests because I like vests. And I would wear them pretty much every day. And instead of having security in the soup kitchen, because we dealt with a lot of homeless people, we dealt with people that were under the influence of drugs and alcohol, security was waitstaff. And my sweet friends, Troy and Traveler and Trish, we all worked and we would fill tea and water and we would make sure people had what they needed. And one day I did not wear my vest. And I was surprised at how many people ask why I didn't have on my uniform. People who said, you know, this is my favorite restaurant. And I always think of you like the maitre d'. In some ways that illustrated that we had done a good job serving. We were security, but we were seen as servants. That was perfect. In other ways, it made me realize the importance of dressing for that occasion, not for anything I wanted, but for what they saw. In a world of uniforms, and many times our homeless people saw uniforms of policemen who were asking them to move along in that part of town, they saw me well-dressed as someone who was there to serve them. And they expected it, and they had every right to. Because I expected them to have good behavior and not fight, and to, to not cause problems in the soup kitchen. And they did just that. We had a good impasse. And somewhere in that, whether or not we were blessed or cursed, whether or not we were poor or rich, whether or not it was heaven or earth, there was a connection between how that system worked. We all came together at God's bounteous table, and we shared a meal. And I had churches and neighbors, but mainly churches who came in every day. We had a different church who would cook. And they had different specialities. One church was especially popular because they fried chicken. And they did a really good job. And every time that they did, and they did about once a year, the people talked to the people. And I had all sorts of additions to the soup kitchen who knew that they were there to cook chicken. Other churches did things that were a little more creative and a little less popular. But at the end of the day, it was this cacophony of people coming together, some with needs, some without, some who served, some who led. Sometimes those you thought had needs didn't. The ones that shouldn't have needs did. And I just had to wear my vest and to do my job. And it was really fun. Those meals were a small part of my day. I was officially the vice president of programs and development. And so we ran a GED program. We ran a bunch of training programs. We did OCAP for the elderly. We ran... But I loved that lunchtime because I knew where I could bring my gifts. I knew what to wear. I was comfortable in what my clothes looked like. I worked really hard not to get too much food on them while I served or poured tea. Sometimes I was successful. Sometimes I was not. But even that, if I got home and I was stained, I knew that it was a stain well spent. It was a badge. It was what I was supposed to do on earth 
so I could earn some reward in heaven. And that felt good all the way around. And it did not feel that it was just me. It was part of a team, part of a family, part of a, a group, a collective, all that. It was part of the community that we work to build. It's part of the community that we do not sever when we talked about why do you break fellowship. These were the crew that came together to feed, to clothe, to take care of, to serve, to tend. It was the best fellowship I could have imagined and probably as close as I will have until I do get to heaven. Our charge then after this Easter is to find ways to build that fellowship, to find out who makes good food and join with them in preparing a table for those that we know and do not, for those that are hungry or aren't, for those that want to join with their church brothers and sisters to cook the food, for those that are homeless and need to eat the food. One of the things we did at the soup kitchen was that we, where we'd skim off the fat for some things, we kept it, conserved it, put it back, because in the winter especially, we wanted a little more fat in people's diets. It was really knowing the people that we served intimately, hearing their stories, people that had been teachers for years and somehow lost a home, people that lost family that never thought they would, people that didn't know where they were sometimes, but knew who we were, at least to them. Our charge is to build that in our own communities, in our own lives, because that is how the Easter miracle lives on. That is the connection that Christ died for, was resurrected for. That is the chance to come back. And sometimes that means come back to a world where we commune with people that we don't even like. Certainly don't approve of. They probably don't approve of us. They may not like the clothes we're wearing. Or they may not like our stories or our songs. But at the end of the day, we can join together to do God's work because that's where we put our mind on God. And all this other stuff falls away as it should. So when it's time to go through the gate, we have clothes that may be threadbare, but are clean. The camel has little on its backs and we can go to a table where we can serve and lead forever with someone who loves us above all things. Let's close in prayer. Oh, gracious, happy resurrection, happy Easter. Huzzah, God. We made it through another year. You made the miracle happen, and here we are again celebrating it. Help us not to take it for granted. Help it not to be the, the fast food in our life or the assurance of heat or light or any of those things that technology and modern times afford. Help us to realize its miraculous nature Help us to understand the cost that you paid, the value that it has for us, and the worth that can last forever if we don't forget and stay mindful, both of what you did and what our forebears did to you to cause that miracle to happen. We've been redeemed from the sins of fathers we did not know. Help us not to make the same mistakes then and pass those sins on Help us to make sure that that redemption which washed us clean, which gave us this new outfit, truly is not discarded. Help us to not expect to get a new outfit every day. Help us to earn the dirt that we get on our clean outfit by doing your work. Because we understand that that, that Bible practice is what makes study possible for the next generation. It's what gives hope to the next generation. And it's what gives the assurance of heaven to us. Because practice in itself is illustration of what we believe and feel in our hearts and a validation of why you took the risk and why you had the faith that we could be better than we thought we could ourselves. Enough that you died for us. Enough that you died to redeem us, to give us clean garments to wear to your bounteous table. Help us then to help others and ourselves to earn, retain, and hunger for an eternity with you. We ask this this Easter day and in future. Amen.
amazing grace How sweet the sound That saved a soul like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind but now I see Was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed When we've been there ten thousand years Bright shining as the sun appears We've no less days to sing God's praise Than when we first begun Amazing grace, how sweet the sound T'was blind, but now I see 